Okay. Here you go. Okay. Um, so I, I'm here to follow up on Elon Babchuk's talk from last week where he laid out the situation of religion in America more broadly. And I want to try to accomplish two things in this talk. One is to take some of those ideas and look at what we know within the Jewish community, which is, as Elon talked about, basically consistent with what we know about religion in America more broadly. But also, we want to look at some of the details for the Jewish community and uh, understand them. And number two is that I want to apply them to the economic model of Jewish organizations that we have. And I'm going to use mostly a synagogue as, a, as the case study because I think we know the most about how synagogues have functioned uh, throughout history. And, um, but I think that a lot of these ideas are going to also be applicable to organizations beyond synagogues with a little bit of imagination, which we can discuss as part of the program. So I want to start with a cartoon that I like to show at the beginning of a lot of these talks, which is a cartoon from The New Yorker, which is basically a, a caveman talking to his son or his grandson and saying, when I was your age, things were exactly the way they are now, because that's not the world that we live in. And I think it's really important to understand that that's not the world that we live in and to be comfortable with that context. So I, I want to show a, a brief video clip that builds on some of the video clips that Elon showed last time and that uh, hopefully you know, keeps us in the tradition of learning from popular culture. And this one is from one of my favorite movies, Austin Powers. And uh, I think that you'll understand the context pretty quickly. So I'm just going to play it. Hang on, I'm going to floor it. Watch out. Move, move, move. Watch out! Watch out! Watch out! Oh, let's go! Come on, let's go! So there was a steamroller coming for this guard, and it really was coming for him, but he was panicking too soon, right? And he was not doing what needed to be done to avoid the fate that was coming for him. And fundamentally, what I am trying to present here is that I think that opportunity is out there for us, right? There is a steamroller, what Elon described and what I'm going to describe potentially represents a steamroller that's coming for some of our institutions, some of the way we've done things traditionally, but it's not as close as we might think it is. And we have time to think about how we want to do things differently. I also like to start by looking at this famous quote by Albert Einstein. If I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and only five minutes thinking about the solution. Right? That the solution, I think, will come relatively naturally once we know that we have described the problem correctly and that we see the bigger picture way to think about the various opportunities. It's really important to take the advice of Jim Collins in the book Good to Great where he talks about what he calls the Stockdale paradox. It's the idea that Jim Stockdale, who was the ranking officer at the Hanoi Hilton prisoner of war camp, described who are the people that survived the prisoner of war camps. And the people who survived the prisoner of war camps were the people who didn't delude themselves as to the the problematic situation that they were in. They didn't have any delusions that their situation was anything other than miserable. They didn't have any delusions that it was going to end anytime soon. They could be there for many years. They accepted that. Think of John McCain of blessed memory. And, um, they, but they, they, and, and so they didn't live with that delusion. If they were deluded, if they thought, oh, this is, this is uh, a steamroller coming for us, right? We're, this is disastrous and we're going to be dead in a week, then they were dead in a week, often at their own hands. If they thought that this is going to end relatively soon, it's terrible now, but in three months we'll be home, they would also often die at their own hand. The people who survived were the people who said, yes, we are going to be in this miserable situation for a while, and at the same time, never lost hope that eventually they would overcome the situation. Something would happen and they would, have, they would go home eventually and their lives would go back to normal eventually or they might have different lives but they would be good lives eventually. And so 
uh, Jim Collins abstracts from this, this principle, abstracts from the story to lay out the Stockdale paradox that he calls it, that the companies that make it, the companies that become great, or the organizations that become great, are those that retain faith that they will prevail in the end, but always confront the most brutal facts of their reality. And so that's some of what I'm, I'm hoping to do here. So let's look at the Pew study, at the information that we have from the Pew study, and sort of relate it to what Elon talked about. So the famous blockbuster finding of the Pew study was that there are 22% of Jews who are what they call Jews of no religion, and that it, among the millennial generation, that was actually a third. So that seems pretty scary if you think of yourself as a, as a religion. Now, I'm going to actually uh, suggest that that situation is actually much worse than we think meaning that I want to really confront the brutal facts of that reality. Because 22% of Jews, or 33% of Jewish millennials in the Pew study were deemed Jews of no religion. It was actually very hard to be called a Jew of no religion in the Pew study. The way the Pew study worked was that they gave you the survey. The first question is, what is your religion? And many options were given, including Jewish. The only people who could possibly be deemed Jews of no religion were the people who, when asked what is your religion and given the option of Jewish as one of the options, nevertheless didn't take that option and checked off no religion. So they were, they were asked, are you Jewish in the context of religion? And they said no. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of friends for whom it is quite clear that Judaism is not functioning in their lives as any kind of religion. And nevertheless, if they're asked, what is your religion, they're first, they'll say, oh, Jewish, right? Because that's sort of the natural thing. So the people who check off no religion when Jewish is an option are the really hardcore no religion people. So that 22% or 33% are people who are Jews of no religion and really religious about their no religion. If you look deeper into the data, what you find is that we have the 22% of Jews who are Jews of no religion. <coughs> we also have an additional 23% of Jews who seldom or never attend services, but nevertheless said their religion was Jewish. So just putting those two together, we have 45% of Jews who basically don't experience Judaism as a religion in their lives, most likely, because these are not the people who go to high holiday services. These are the people who go less often than high holiday services, because the next statistic is that an additional 31% of Jews go to services a few times a year, like the high holidays. That was the question. So, the, so, so th if those are the people that we think of the high holiday Jews, hey, they're not very religious, well, that's, that's already after you've put 45% on the side of, of even less religious than those. So if you add all of those together, we have up to 76%, and I say up to because often when I put it this way, people say, yeah, but people have uh, Judaism in their home, right? They're, they are doing religious things at home, they're just not going to synagogue, or they're somehow uh, experiencing Judaism religiously in some other way. So it might not be 76%, but it's somewhere between 45% and 76%, and I think closer to 76%, that I think we can reasonably call Jews of not much religion. And if you think about Jewish institutions, in particular synagogues, being institutions that are fundamentally organized to be institutions that understand Judaism to be fundamentally a religion, then at the very least we can say that 76% of Jews, or up to 76% of Jews, are not vibing with that core purpose of some of these major Jewish institutions of the 20th century. And that's the, the brutal reality that I, I kind of want to put out there as, as a kind of a starting position. Now, we, we know there's other data from the Pew study that I don't want to go over in detail, but it has to do with the denominations kind of shrinking, particularly conservative Judaism, which went from about 35% of the American Jewish population in 1990 to 18% in 2013 at the Pew study. So the conservative movement has basically uh, collapsed by half. Now, where did all those people go? The, the data from the Pew study suggests that people tend to sort of drop drop down, I put that in quotes, in terms of religious observance, one denomination. So where all those conservative Jews went is to the reform movement. But the reform movement stayed stable in terms of how many Jews are reformed. That means that the same number that went from conservative to reform went from reform somewhere else. So the reform movement isn't doing so well either. Um, and, it's just, and once the conservative movement collapses completely, then the reform movement will start 
collapsing in terms of its numbers. So, so the, another brutal reality that, that I think that we have to face. Now, there's positive news in the Pew report, which is that even among the Jews of no religion, who are the hardcore Jews of no religion, 83% are proud to be Jewish. It's not that they don't deny that they're Jewish. They're proud to be Jewish. So something is going on here where they experience being Jewish as something worthy of pride, but the thing that we have often thought of Judaism as fundamentally being in the 20th century in America is not who they are. So what is that? That, to me, relates to what Benjamin Zander was talking about in the story about the shoe salesman in Africa, where one of them sees it as there's no point in our doing anything here. These people don't wear shoes. And the other person said, what an incredible opportunity. These people haven't heard about shoes yet. So we could look at that 76% of Jews and say, what a crisis. Or we could look at those 76% of Jews and say, what an opportunity for us to figure out what a Judaism would be that they would find not only a source of pride, but also a source of, of compelling interest and participation. And so I, I want to just briefly suggest that we've been here before for perhaps different reasons or perhaps actually similar reasons. But when the, the Second Temple was destroyed and it actually had been kind of falling apart for at least 100 years before, not physically, but in terms of Jews feeling connected to that kind of Judaism or that kind of Israelite religion, that that was a terrible crisis for the priests. As our mentor Erwin Kula says, it was an opportunity for the rabbis. And we also know, if we kind of look around major cities like New York and see some of the synagogues that are there that are grander than the temple in Jerusalem ever was, that, that rabbinic Judaism was kind of uh, an inferior version of Judaism perhaps when it started out, but even in terms of the tangible physical aspects, it, it actually became just as, just as glorious uh, later. So it's, a, it's important to understand that sometimes in these shifts, Another brutal reality, right, is sometimes in these shifts, it gets worse before it gets better, or it gets a little less grand or a little less exciting before it gets more exciting again. That's an idea that I want you to be thinking about as we sort of move forward. So I want to think about the situation that we have today, the brutal facts of reality, as potentially a crisis for our institutions, but an opportunity for Judaism. And then the question is whether our existing institutions can take advantage of that opportunity or whether that opportunity is going to have to be only the opportunity of new folks, right? And we see that out in the innovation sector in the Jewish community today. And 2,000 years ago, those innovators were called the rabbis. The priests didn't figure this out. Maybe we can. So now I want to shift a little bit to economics. And there's been some really interesting writing about the economics of Jewish life recently. And I want to recommend two books for you to, to consider if you're interested in this and you want to think further. One is called Judaism in Transition by Carmel Chiswick, who is a, a labor economist, a professor of economics. And she writes a lot about Judaism as an economic enterprise. And by the way, I don't mean that as simply how do we have the money to keep our organizations going. One of the ideas that Carmel Chiswick puts out is that economics is not the study of money. Economics is the study of limited resources. And an important limited resource is time. And she points out as a labor economist that the wealthier people are, the more they value every minute of their time. And so when the Jews are poor, they feel better about spending many hours in the synagogue or many hours doing this or that Jewish activity. As they become wealthier, they might feel not as good about spending as much time doing that. Again, a brutal reality. We could try to figure out how to make them feel comfortable spending all that same amount of time, but we probably have to give them more than they had been getting because that time has become more valuable to them. So that's just one example of how this isn't only about how do we get the money to fund our institutions, although that's much of what I'm going to be talking about today. The other book is called Pennies for Heaven, the History of American Synagogues and Money by Dan Judson, who is the dean of the rabbinical school at Hebrew College. And this one really is about money. It's about the history of how synagogues have been funded. And I really think it's a required reading for any synagogue board member to understand that the way that it has been in our memory is not the way it's always been. And if it's not the way it's always been, I think all the more so it doesn't have to be the way that it has to be. So those books are, are, are very valuable and interesting. Um, 
but I want to give you a sort of uh, more of a heuristic, more of a way to look at this that is a little bit more visual and conceptual than some of the, the detailed economics that some of these books um, can contain. So I want to show you that, as, as I see it, this is the kind of economic model of the American synagogue in the mid to late 20th century. That I, I would argue that the membership of the American synagogue, and again, we can abstract to other types of institutions from this, was made up basically of three types of people who I'm calling the people that are there for observance, right? These are the people, observance may or may not be the right word, but these are the people who are there because they love the services. It's meaningful to them. They want to pray. They want to have a relationship with God. They believe in it. They really want to be there for their own deep religious needs. The second group are the people that I'm calling um, the people that are there for obligation or insurance purposes. We'll come back to that. And the third group are the people who are there for a sense of belonging. They're there to meet a human need, not a Jewish need. They're there to meet a human need for belonging. And Jews were not welcomed into many American institutions for a long period up until, let's say, the, the late 20th century. There was definitely a need for Jewish organizations to provide the good of belonging to people who couldn't really get it anywhere else. Now, what do I mean by that middle group, the people that are there for, for obligation or insurance purposes? What I mean is that there are a lot of people who, for some reason, it may be internal, it may be sort of internal, it may be family pressure, think that or thought that they should be members of a synagogue even though they never went or very rarely went. They're nevertheless willing to pay thousands of dollars of annual dues for a good that they basically don't use. I want to make an analogy that may offend some, but I think it's still worth considering that this is similar to the economic model of a gym, in that the only way that a gym is economically sustainable is if there is a large number of people who never actually work out, but nevertheless pay the monthly gym dues. Because if they all wanted to work out, there wouldn't be room for them. If they didn't pay, or they only paid when they did come to work out, there wouldn't be enough money to buy the equipment for the people who do work out all the time. And I want to suggest that that's the same thing for the American synagogue, right? If the people who never come said they weren't going to pay the, bill, the, the dues anymore, there wouldn't be enough money to pay the rabbi's salary, the cantor's salary, the building, all the things that make the product or the experience available for the people who do come all the time. So there's a sort of a subsidy model going on here where the people who don't participate are subsidizing the experience of the people who do participate. There's no dishonor in that. That's a tried and true business model that sustains a lot of organizations like gyms. But the moment that people don't feel the need to work out anymore, let's say a pill was invented that allowed people to lose weight and gain muscle mass as they wanted, and they no longer felt a a, a, a guilt or a duty to belong to a gym, they would stop joining gyms and the gyms would all close because there aren't actually enough people who do want to use the gym to sustain the gyms. That is a, a way of, of, of thinking about what we're experiencing in the landscape of synagogues and Jewish organizations more broadly. But there's actually a second piece that, that I want to put in here. And I debated whether to call these two different groups, and I, and, I, and I wasn't sure which one to put in the outer circle and which one to put in the inner circle. So I ended up saying, saying that they're actually sort of similar, and we could think of them as one, one group that's sort of experiencing the, the same uh, feelings in the sa at the same time. And that's the people that are there, the synagogue, kind of for an insurance purpose. Right? Think about the, the business model of a health insurance company or another kind of insurance company where it says, look, I, I don't get anything out of paying insurance. I don't get anything out of this day to day. But it might be that something will happen in my life where I'm going to need this. And if the only way that I can get this is by having paid the dues all along, then I'll do it. So what are those things? A marriage of my kids, a funeral for myself or for my parents, right? a bar mitzvah for my kids. I might not even have kids yet, but I might have kids in the future, and I want them to be bar mitzvahed or bat mitzvahed by the rabbi who's known them since they were a baby, right? So there's all kinds of ways that we can sort of describe that insurance um, experience, but there's a lot of people, and I think we all know them, who 
if you ask them why they're a member of a synagogue, it's because they, they're concerned that they'll need that service at some time in the future. Now, there are two things happening there. Number one is that a lot of people don't feel that need as desperately anymore, right? If I die and I don't have a rabbi, my friend can conduct the, the service. Uh, if, I, if I get married, I have a friend who can get their uh, certificate on the internet to be a marriage efficient, and actually that would be more meaningful to me than a rabbi, and we can break some glass and do whatever. Right? We, there's nobody stopping us from using the Jewish rights that we feel connected to, but I don't need a rabbi there, right? So once I don't have that insurance need anymore, then I don't need to pay the, d the dues. I don't need to pay the premiums. Right? So I think we're also seeing that as a reason. So what we're, what we're sort of seeing in the Jewish world is, is a collapse of the insurance and the um, sort of the insurance and the obligation need, right? The insurance and the gym need are sort of dropping away. So I want to um, sort of show that on this, um, on this, on this uh, picture is that we always had a group of non-participants, right? There have always been people, Jews in America, who never joined a synagogue or never joined any other Jewish organization. For whatever reason, they didn't feel they needed it. They didn't feel they wanted it. So there was always this group of non-participants. I would suggest that starting in the, in, the, in the 50s and sort of going on and accelerating in the 1970s and 1980s, the, the need for synagogues to fulfill my human yearning for belonging dropped away for most Jews, right? Jews began to be accepted very broadly in American society. They could join any club they wanted for the most part, and they didn't need to join the synagogue to get that good of belonging anymore. So that group dropped away. That's been our situation sort of um, going into the 21st century. What I'm suggesting is that what we're seeing now is an accelerating drop in the, ne in the, in the number of people who need the um, gym or insurance goods that synagogues have been providing, right? The sort of psychological. You could think of it as, as the belonging as, as a kind of a psychological good, and this other, this gym or insurance idea as another kind of psychological good that people were getting, right? They weren't participating almost at all. They weren't getting any experience. They weren't getting any day-to-day -day thing out of this. They were just getting a psychological sense met that they were members of a synagogue and either that made them feel good, made them feel they were doing the right thing, or made them feel that if X, Y, or Z happens, I, I can get those needs addressed. And to the extent that fewer and fewer people feel those needs, we have a, a, a drop of that group. And I think that the fear that, that, that the, the sort of, um, the existential fear that we hear from a lot of Jewish organizations is basically how much of that can drop away before we are no longer viable as an organization. Now, I wanna, I wanna suggest that that is a troubling way to look at it. Um, but before I do, I, let me just, um, let me just uh, show the, so, so the, the, question, the question is uh, how many of those people can drop away and how many of the observant people can become less observant. The truth is that's less of a problem because the people who are observant, who become a little less observant, are probably still going to stay members of the synagogue or you know, whatever institution we're talking about. So we, we are afraid that these lines are, are contracting even more and we don't know where the red line is, where, where our institutions are going to no longer be viable. The concern that I have is that fra framing the question this way is fundamentally, uh, is fundamentally violating what Benjamin Zander was talking about in his TED talk, where he said, you know, the, the classical music world is asking, how can we get things to go from 3% to 4%? At 4%, we'd be viable. 3% were not viable, so let's shoot for 4%. The alternative that he gave us was if, that this is, this is something that everybody could, could love and, and get something out of. And he asked the question, you know, how would you walk? How would you talk? How would you be if you thought that the goal was for everybody to connect to this, not just how could we keep our institutions viable? And I want to suggest that we can look at it this way. The reason why we might be having this conversation is because we're afraid that our institutions are about to cross some of those lines that makes them not viable. But let's take that urgency as an opportunity to ask a different question, which is A, how can we make our institutions viable again, but B, how can we maybe make this of value to everybody, right? To even the non-participants, the people who've never participated in Jewish life. Well, why weren't they participating? Is there maybe some way that we could have gotten them to participate 100 years ago, but we didn't because we didn't have an institutional urgency. Our institutions were fine, so we weren't so motivated to try to get those non-participants to participate. Now that our institutions are not fine, Let's not leave them out. Maybe they're our future. 
So, 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 and, and we have a traditional, um, a traditional story that I, I think really connects to this, which is uh, from the, the Talmud, from the tractate Brachot, uh, page 28a, for those who are looking for it. It's a, a famous story of the head of the early rabbinic academy at Yavne, Rabban Gamliel, who was very kind of strict and said, you know, I only want people here for the right reasons. And, you know, he didn't let people come in to study in the yeshiva unless they met a certain set of characteristics. And at a certain point, uh, Rabban Gamliel was deposed from his position as the head of this academy, the head of this yeshiva, and he was replaced with a different rabbi, Elazar ben Azariah, who, by the way, was a young man, um, to the extent that we sometimes think about innovation coming from youth. It's a little bit uh, in this story as well. Um, and Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah opens the gates to, uh, to the yeshiva so that anybody could come and study who wanted to. And then, in good Jewish fashion, the Talmudic rabbis have a debate. Did they have to add 400 new benches or 700 new benches once the doors were open? But the point is, is that there were 400 or 700 benches worth of people desperate to connect to Judaism who were being kept out by the well-meaning decisions that were being made by the guy in charge. And the, the story ends with a beautiful coda where Rabban Gamliel, the original head, feels depressed. And he says, maybe I have withheld the Torah from the people of Israel, right? He realizes that I was wrong, right? And in my being wrong about what the essences were, what the essence was, what the requirements were, perhaps I have led to a situation where people who wanted to connect to Judaism were unable to. And, and so the question, you know, well, what happens next is, is really the, the fundamental question. So what I want to, so that, that's really where I want to uh, suggest that it's, it's so important for us to, to start to ask this question, to say, how can we think about making something for those people who are, you know, out there? Um, you know, because that is both our sacred obligation and also perhaps the, the, the future for our institutions. It's really hard to get back the people who have left by making some kind of tweaks, right? They generally don't leave because, you know, you didn't market well enough or because you, um, you know, they, they got a new canter and they didn't quite like the services as much as they did anymore. Sometimes that happens, but usually the, the reason why large numbers of people are leaving uh, Jewish organizational life is because something is happening internally to them where they don't really need it anymore. And it, it, it and, and so you can, you can try to, uh, make changes to the services or whatever your core activity is in a way that's going to appeal to them. But likely, and, and we don't really have time today to delve deep into the data, but if we did, it, you would see it there. It, that the, the fact is, is that the people who are participating are actually quite different from the people who are not participating, such that in order to uh, create a single, quote, product, a single type of experience that's going to appeal to both, is not really possible and tends to destroy the experience for the people who are still inside, the people who are still getting something out of it. And then they start to leave because they'll go to the more traditional synagogue or the more, uh, you know, the, the, the institution that's kind of more in line with, with what they are. So that's partly why you also tend to get a, an extreme, you know, a growing extremes, right, on, on both directions because the, the people who are sort of inside start to feel abandoned by these organizations that are desperately trying to bring in new people, so to speak. So there, there's, a, there's an approach to, to how to um, address this, which is the approach that we really cover in this program, and that I want to just very briefly sort of put out there um, as, we, as we wrap up this, this uh, presentation. And that's um, an approach that says, let's not try to change the core thing that we do. Let's keep that for the people who still really love it. Let's, let's do that. Let's, we might have to move a little bit of resources out of that because if we, have, if we don't have new resources, we're going to have to find resources somewhere. In this program, we, we try to help you do that by saying, well, let's, let's not tr change all of our energies there. Let's move, you know, maybe one day a month, let's focus on the people that are uh, not here or something like that. You know, let's, let's allocate a little bit of resources out of this pot and, uh, and over to this pot, but not in a way that's going to harm the experience of the people who are really quite happy. And what do we do with those resources that we freed up? We start running a lot of experiments. And again, we sort of understand that the people who are outside of our organizations are probably fundamentally different 
from the people who are inside of our organizations. So the first thing that we have to do is find out what the needs are of the people who are not getting their needs met inside of our organization. If it turns out that their needs are exactly the same needs as the people who are inside, and for some reason we think that it's just that they didn't hear about it, great, that's a marketing issue. But I don't think that that's what you're gonna hear most of the time, right? What you're gonna hear most of the time is, I have a desperate need to be a better parent. And there's nothing going on in the synagogue that teaches me how to be a better parent, right? Um, right I have a desperate need to figure out how to manage the craziness of my life. And there's nothing going on at the synagogue that helps me manage the craziness of my life, right? Whatever those needs turn out to be, right? I have a need for community. Then people get excited. Oh, we, have, we provide community. We're warm and welcoming. You know, that's what we do. Yeah, but they want community with people like them, right? Who are, who, in, in all sorts of other ways. So are you able to provide community for the people that you already provide community for and for a different kind of person? I think you are, but, the, but it's still a different, it's a different thing. It's not because the community that we already provide in the synagogue is a, yeah, it's a community, but in order to get it, you have to sit for three hours a week at the synagogue service, which you don't believe in, right? So uh, I'm going to say, yeah, I'm desperate to have community, but I'm not willing to pay that, right? I'm not willing to pay the money, and I'm not willing to pay the time, and I'm not willing to pay what you're asking me to do with the time. But I would be willing to pay money, and I would be willing to pay time, for the good of community, but you have to give it to me in a way that doesn't require me to pay something that I'm not willing to pay. Um, and, and we have to sort of try to figure out what that is. So what, what, I, uh, uh, what we're gonna cover in this program is an approach inspired by, although we're not uh, only religious about this, but in, in, an approach inspired by the work of Clayton Christensen and Bob Mesta, who we'll hear from next week, who are uh, leading scholars and practitioners of a concept called the jobs to be done approach, which really is built around imagining that that person that you're hoping to connect with, think of them as a, as a, as a company in their own right with a job opening. They have a job description that they're writing for their own lives. Right? I need this in order to make my life better. Here's the description. And then the question is, can we do that job? So, so, but step one is that we have to find out what the job description is. It's like the people who apply for jobs, right, never read the job description, and there are lots of people like this. I mean, I get applications from these people all the time. You see them in a second, because they, their cover letter doesn't say anything about your organization. They just, any job that they see pop up on the board, they send a letter to. You don't hire those people. You hire the people who actually looked at the job description and even did some more research on the organization. They really know, they really know, um, uh, that, that you cared about, you know, that, that, that your job description meets their needs. So we have to first really understand in a deep way what are the jobs that people uh, have to do in their lives that they might be looking to hire our organization, our religion, our people to do for them. Um, and the other, uh, and, and, and that often has to do with uh, where they are in Maslow's hierarchy of needs or analogous concepts, right? And I think that a major change in the, in the situation of the Jews is that now many Jews are sort of stable in all sorts of ways in America and are looking for the kinds of things that are at the higher end of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? A sense of meaning, right? Higher order ideas, right? Maslow calls it self-actualization, but it's, it's I'm looking for meaning, I'm looking for a community of meaning, I'm looking to, to contribute to the world in a more powerful way. Um, that's, I think, what we're often going to find when we have these conversations. By the way, famously, um, Steve Jobs quoted Henry Ford talking about how if I asked the people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. But what, they, what, what that means is that the people don't always know how to articulate what they want in language that works for the engineer. You have to, that means you have to listen even harder. So when somebody says, what I need is a faster horse, I understand from that what they need is to get somewhere faster. So if I can get there faster without a horse, then I can tell them, hey, I got something that, that works better than a horse, then they're happy, they would want that. Um, so it's not a dismissive uh, point, it's actually a point that means we need to listen even uh, more carefully. Um, and the other piece that I, I really wanna connect here is Simon Sinek's Start With Why, the TED Talk that, that you saw about that. Because we can't do every job that's out there. You shouldn't apply for every job that's out there. You should only apply for the jobs that you think you could do well, and that kind of meet your, your personal mission. So our organizations have missions, have reasons for existing. 
we have to think about why we are, exist. But let's, let's think about that as carefully as, as we said that we have to ask people what their needs are and listen carefully. We have to ask ourselves what our purpose is and listen carefully. So maybe we thought our purpose was to you know, preserve the halakha and, and everything that we do has to do with Jewish law. Maybe that is our purpose and maybe it's not. But let's ask ourselves, let's have a deep conversation about what would we be willing to do in addition to what we're doing now. And fundamentally, um, we want to connect our why with their job, right? And, and those are the experiments that we should run. So when we talk to people and we find out what their <coughs> needs are, and we say, yeah, we, we, that, actually, that need actually fits with our mission, let's try that out. And when we do that, what we'll see is that these kind of um, startup organizations, all of these Jewish startup organizations that are succeeding are fundamentally doing what I just described. They don't have the challenge of having to manage their current constituents because they didn't have any current constituents. But we as an organization, if we can allocate a little bit of resources to try to um, hunt down some of these, these various efforts that these organizations have done, we can try all these different experiments for all these different kinds of Jews that are out there. Now, we shouldn't put all our eggs in one basket because we're not sure what's going to work. If we knew what was going to work, we wouldn't have this program where we bring you through a process. We would just tell you what works. But we don't know either. But we do know that the process of experimentation through this lens does lead to, to beneficial results and is working and has worked in smaller ways for lots of organizations, whether startups or legacy organizations. And so we think it, it seems to be leading in a promising direction where perhaps in a few decades from now, we'll be able to say, oh, yeah, this, this is what we do now. But we're not there yet, so we're in this process of experimentation. In that process, some of the experiments are gonna work. Are gonna, right, more people are gonna wanna connect with them. They'll have richer experiences. They'll be more and more excited. They'll wanna learn more. Those experiences will get deeper. Right? At first, they start a little bit thin, but they'll thicken up. Right? Let's, at that point, let's stop doing the ones that aren't working. Right? So now we have these ones that we're really focused on, and we help them get even a little bit better. And, and more people come, and they get deeper, and they get thicker, right? And over time, as we start to invest in the ones that are working, we start to see those people out there that we thought left, they didn't leave. They just were waiting around for the right thing. And once we, we see that, and once we, we have connections with those people, we sort of redefine our organization from the circle over on the left where it was to this oval that's kind of uh, addressing a, a different and broader population. And that's fundamentally what we're trying to achieve in this program, is for you to sort of take the first step in experimenting in this way. And if you build that into a habit of your organization over time, and we're going to bring you through that cycle two times, but over time, when you go through that cycle 10 times, you're going to start to find the couple of approaches that are going to start to have resonance. And then you're going to start investing in those more, more deeply. And eventually, I think that you will all be able to find a new approach that's going to work well for your organization that, importantly, preserves what the people who love the organization loved about it. That will remain. Their experience will remain. And also has provided new kinds of experiences and new kinds of ways of connecting for the people who we're not looking for, and by, and by the way, we're never really looking for that core experience that you are offering. And so when all is said and done, what, what we're able to produce is not an attempt to stave off economic disaster and to keep our institutions viable, but is in fact a new kind of institution that is more successful actually than it ever was before, because now your constituents are not a small group of people who are really loving the experience and a bunch of other people who are paying the dues for some other reason, but actually a, an organization in which all of the people who are paying the dues or who are donating or however it's funded are doing so because they themselves are getting an experience that's changing their lives for the better. And, and that's the opportunity that I want to close with, the idea that in Jim Collins or in um, Jim Stockdale's paradox, right, that we have to start by accepting the brutal facts of reality, but that's not so that we can get depressed, and it's not so that we can try to fix the one thing that's going to get us from 3% to 4%, but so that we can get ourselves onto the pathway that potentially makes our, our organization more important, more impactful, more wonderful than it's ever been in our history, and that's our goal with this program.